So we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 36 this morning. Before I do, I want to share something that undoubtedly, I think undoubtedly, everyone in the room probably will nod in agreement with. They'll go, oh, yep, 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 that's true, that's right. But when we're honest with ourselves, is much more difficult to trust in practice. And it's simply this. You ready for this? God is smarter than you. Right? So everyone's like, yeah, of course, of course he is, right? Of course he is. But in practice, a lot of times it's hard to acknowledge that. It's hard to yield to that. It's hard to surrender to that. God is smarter than you. He's, he's like infinitely smarter than you and I. He knows all. He sees all. He acts in complete wisdom in all. He never makes a mistake. He never needs advice. He, his plans are perfect. And none of those things, right, are true of us. Interestingly, Isaiah speaks of this reality. He speaks within this reality of us being finite and really us being broken and rebellious before God and God knowing all. And within this, this reality, this, this reality of God's transcendence, what's really interesting is we don't see God as detached and aloof and condemning. But rather in this context where, where Isaiah is bringing out the fact that God is, is so high in his thoughts, so high in his ways, and we are not, we see God wanting us to turn to him. Wanting us to turn from our sinful ignorance to his beautiful presence. That he would show us mercy. It's really an amazing thing. It's really an amazing thing that in the moment of God's, tra- speaking of God's transcendence, we don't see lightning bolts coming from heaven and, and just frying us in our ignorance and our sin. Instead, God says in his transcendence, turn to me. Turn to me. I'm the one who knows. I'm the one whose ways are perfect. So he says this in Isaiah 55. Isaiah says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. And then he talks about our rebellion, our wickedness. He says, let the wicked forsake their way and the righteous, the unrighteous, their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, right? That's the idea of repentance, of changing your way, of turning to the Lord. And he will have mercy on them and and the lord and to our god for he will freely pardon and then the lord speaks and what he says is for he says for my thoughts are not your thoughts Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Hmm. God's smarter than you. And in that reality, and in that transcendence, he says what you need to do is turn from your wicked ways, turn from your ignorance, and turn to him, and you will find mercy and free pardon. It's incredible. So I've mentioned, as we've been walking through Romans 9 through 11, that these chapters focus heavily on on how Israel's general rejection, and we'll say general, right, because not all Israel had rejected, but by and large, Israel's general rejection and the Gentile world's general acceptance, certainly not all Gentiles received Christ, but he was being received, he was being received in mass numbers by the non-Jewish people, how this, this tension is to be understood in God's plan of redemption, This is important for us to still understand 
in our modern context. And it was important for them in their personal context. It was personally applicable to this church in Rome because as you walked into this church in Rome, you had this crazy array of diversity, right, of of landowners, rich people and poor people, of, of those who were walking around free and those who were slaves. And, and you had people from all different nations and you had non-Jewish people and Jewish people who were getting together, worshiping the same Jesus, eating together. And it's like, okay, so how, how do we work this out within this diversity? The, the early church was remarkably diverse remarkably inclusive, but had their unity, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, around the central focus of trusting in and following Jesus in full devotion. So again, they're incredibly varied, incredibly diverse, all over the map, male, female, rich, poor, different nations, but it's like they have the same central focus. What is it to follow Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? And that's where they had unity. But at times, oh, and, and I should just say, it's still meant to be that way. It's still meant to be that way. The church is still meant to be incredibly diverse, incredibly inclusive, but with, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, Tim Mackey says, with this, with this exclusive central focus of what it is to follow and be devoted to Jesus and how that works out in our lives. Um, but at times, this comes with great struggle, right? This comes, we tend to gravitate to people who look like us, sound like us, have similar experiences. So to, to be thrown into a group that's so diverse and so varied, that can come with tension and struggle. So it's really important in their context to gain clarity in what God was doing through Jew and non-Jew alike as he brought them together. And I do just want to make a quick side note that, that these chapters and the truths of these chapters leave no room for either extreme of, and hopefully this is, hopefully this is painfully evident, of anti-Semitism, nor does it leave room for the other extreme of saying that, that Israel kind of has this, this carte blanche blind approval of anything and everything it does because it's Israel. It's not meant to lead us to either extreme. And unfortunately, through church history, both those extremes have been adopted um, by some Christians. But instead, it speaks of what God is doing through his plans of salvation, making for himself a multi-ethnic family of faith from all nations. So for them, it was really important for Jewish Christians to realize, and this would have blown their mind, that God is expanding this idea of Israel to include spiritual descendants of Abraham, right? We go all the way back to what he taught in chapter four. Spiritual descendants of Abraham who put their faith in Messiah Jesus, even when they're not Jewish. And it was also then really important for, for Gentile Christians to see that God hadn't forsaken ethnic Israel because God is faithful to his promises. So let's read um, verses 25, 26, 27, get us started here. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be what? What is it? Conceited. So that you will not be conceited. So this, this is important. He's saying this is part of the goal that you not be arrogant, that you not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles or the non-Jews has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. And he quotes a couple of prophets. He says, the deliverer will come from Zion who will turn godlessness away from Jacob and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So Paul is concerned in this, 
diverse community. I, I heard it said, I was listening to a message this week about how sometimes Paul gets this rap like somehow that he was like a chauvinist and, you know, like he, he gets this really bad rap. But what he did was he, he was used by God to create these multi-ethnic, multi-socioeconomic um, communities and they were living together, not perfectly, but in unity. He's like, this, this guy said he actually accomplished what like we haven't even accomplished in America, by and large, right? Like, like so he said, is there still racism in America? Yeah, there is. Is there still like classism in America? Sure, there is, right? So these are still problems that a couple hundred years later, this great dream of America that we're still struggling through. And 2,000 years ago, God used this, this, this Jew, right, that served Christ for about 30 years before he got his head cut off because he was serving Jesus so fervently, right? He used this Jew to build these multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-class communities that were living together in unity. It's like, and you're judging this guy for what? <laughs> he did what you guys, what you guys in the American dream haven't even figured out yet. But of course, this was done because their focus was following Christ together, as should ours, as, it, as this should still play out. So he was concerned, though, because again, these were still people that were working it out in real time uh, within their brokenness and their backgrounds and their, their sinful tendencies. He was concerned how Jews and Gentiles may be posturing toward one another in the church, that, that each group might think for different reasons they have reason for pride, that each group might think for different reasons that they have a leg up on the other, right? We're always trying to do this in our sinfulness. We're always trying to find like, how do I have a leg up? How am I doing better? How are you under me? We don't usually say it in those terms, but even some subconsciously we're playing these sort of games. And, and Paul's like, hey, if you think that, you, you need to realize nothing can be farther from the truth. Instead, each finds themselves equally in need of God's mercy and equally blessed in Christ in his grace. And in fact, there's this, this mysterious dovetailing relationship between the two, between Jew and Gentile in God's redemptive plan. And there's this truth that they're to be united as one family. But to bring that about, God is using them in distinct ways. And again, he's been explaining this through these last few chapters. But what God is doing leaves neither with room for arrogance or pride or conceit. The truth of God should always dispel pride and lead to humble gratitude toward God and then in our relations with others. So here's just maybe a little mental note. Whenever you find yourself leaning towards arrogance, what it means is that you are, at least in that area, you are not walking in the, in the truth and reality of God. Okay, right? So you lean, wherever you tend to lean toward arrogance or pride or haughtiness or conceit, you can be sure of this. You are not walking in that place within the truth of God, the reality of God. Because the truth of God dispels pride and leads toward humble gratitude toward God and our relations with others. So Paul's like, let's unpack a mis this mystery. Or let's maybe we could say continue to unpack this mystery. Now, it, when we think of the word mystery, we tend to think of something that was veiled, something that's difficult to understand, especially something that's yet to be revealed. Oh, it's a mystery, right? So, so if you might read your crime dramas or, or watch your crime shows, right? I, I like to occasionally read kind of a whodunit, and, and you're reading throughout the whole thing, and it's a mystery, right? Until you get to the very end, typically, 
But often when the Bible speaks of a mystery, it's actually bringing us to the end of the detective novel. Right? It's, it's saying that something is going to be revealed that has been obscured for ages past. I'm bringing, like, Paul's like, let me bring you to the last chapter. Let me show you and unveil what's happening in this mystery. And the mystery that's being uncovered and explained here is the relationship between Israel and the Gentiles and their respective responses to Jesus. In chapter 9, if you remember, Paul spoke of how God used the hardening of Pharaoh's heart in his redemptive plan. He actually used it for his redemptive purposes. And, and that illustration was in this context of beginning to flesh out and explore Israel's general rejection of their own prophesied Messiah. So here Paul's showing again that God is indeed doing the same with the hardening of Israel's heart in that he will use it for his redemptive purposes. And these purposes are twofold. For one, God is using Israel's hardening. And remember, if you, if you were following along or paying attention, there's this idea of a judicial hardening, of God giving people over to their sin and over to their unbelief. He's using this hardening as the opportunity to do a mighty work through the gospel, in non-Jewish nations. So again, where this should resonate is like, oh, good, because that means we Gentiles have received the benefit. It might sound a little weird to you, but this, like, remember, God's smarter than you. God's smarter than me, okay? That, that God is using this hardening of Israel to, to do this mighty work among non-Jewish nations nations, including us, right? We Gentiles. This hardening is partial for the Jews in that a remnant already was turning to Jesus. There's a remnant. He spoke about that already in these chapters. And it's temporary because God will use it for a season until he brings into his fold, or we could say using the illustration Paul used last week, he, gra he is grafted into his olive tree. Th we talk about family trees, right? So God's talking about his family tree in, earlier in chapter 11. And he's saying he's grafted in some of these wild shoots and branches, these Gentiles. And when he's finished grafting them in, he's going he's gonna to return to a work with ethnic Israel themselves. So really in this unexpected way, and again, it's very unexpected, in this unexpected way, Israel's still fulfilling its purpose through the promise given to Abraham to, that through him all peoples on the earth will be blessed. But secondly, this work among the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people that turn to Christ, will actually become a catalyst by which Israel eventually responds to Christ. Now, again, there's part of this that is genuinely mystery because it seems like there's part of it that continues to be being worked out, maybe even, or probably even remains future. So I won't be foolishness, foolish enough to say that I know with certainty what this final restoration of Israel will look like. But Paul is surely saying that God's not done with his old covenant people that he will indeed prove faithful to his promises. In fact, God will use the present response of the non-Jewish nations to that end. Now, the term all Israel in verse 26 need not be understood as every single Jewish person or person of Jewish descent. Um, Douglas Moo points out that even in the Old Testament, the phrase all Israel often refers to some Israelites as a representative, representative whole. But rather, Paul seems to be saying that, that there will be what we kind of call this wholesale 180 on the part of many Jews that will represent eth ethnic Israel in their response 
to Jesus as Messiah. And some people have tied this to the second coming. Some people think that, that the way Paul uses these quotes in Isaiah and, and from Jeremiah is talking about this response for many Jews in the second coming. Some people think of this as a, as a gradual turning, that those Jews that had been cut off will be, as he says um, in verse 23, regrafted into the tree. They were cut off because unbelief, but when they turn to Christ in belief, they're regrafted into God's family tree. But we should be, before we move on here, I, I think that in our context, we should be reminded here that we still need to have a really big vision of God's work of redemption. A really big vision of God's work of redemption. It's never just about us. Whatever, who, whatever and whoever us are. That grammar was probably really horrible, sorry. Right? So it's never just about us. It's never just about our circle, our nation, our tradition. We tend to get very small and we get blinders on about what God is doing in his work of redemption. But it's never just about us. So we need to have a really big vision of what God is doing. God is still about the work of building his new family. And that family is much more diverse and, and, and much, much bigger and inclusive than our limited circle and experience. He's still calling all people to himself. And what we hold in common as Christians is not, is not specifically our race or our culture or our experience. It's not specifically a worldly nationalism or politics. It's not a socioeconomic status. It's not worldly ideals. What we hold in common as Christians is that we together need God's mercy and that we together have found God's mercy in Jesus. And then we together pursue the common goal in all our variety of saying, what is it to be devoted to him as he defines it? What a beautiful picture. Verses 28 through 32. <clears throat> as far as the gospel is concerned, they, that is Israel, are enemies on your account. As far as election is concerned... Right, God's sovereign choice. They, they are loved on account of the patriarchs for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you, so again, so let's think about that. Just think about that phrase. God's gifts and call are what? Irrevocable, okay? God's gifts and call are irrevocable. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, Right, You were postured as enemies to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. And again, you have this mysterious dovetailing of what God is doing between the Israel and the Gentiles. So they too have become disobedient in order that you too may receive mercy. There's a now in there. There's some question whether that should be there or not. May now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Hmm. So here again, we see that Israel's general rejection of Jesus has become, in God's master plan, an advantage to non-Jewish peoples. Israel has, by and large, stood in opposition or as enemies to the gospel. But yet Paul's like, don't think in this that even though, by and large, many in Israel have postured themselves that way, don't think that this mean God, means God has turned his back on ethnic Israel. Why? Why is he so sure that he has not? Yeah, yes, because he's like, it's not totally about them. It's about God, and God's really smart, and God is perfectly faithful. Okay, so he's trusting in what God has promised, <laughs> 
all right? This should, be a, this should be a word. This should be a word of encouragement for us. He's like, you know why I know that God will not give up on his ethnic people of Israel? Because he's promised them things. And he's going to be faithful to his promise. His gifts and his call are irrevocable. What God has promised, what God has given in his mercy and his grace, and who God has called to himself are final, permanent, binding, and irreversible. Now, this is still contingent on one of Paul's major themes, that we are still responsible to respond to God's gifts and call with faith. But God will never recant on his call. He will never turn away someone who comes to him because he's faithful to himself. And he's faithful to his promises. This will prove true to his promises to ethnic Israel and it will prove true to his promises to the church. And in the end, all his promises are wrapped up in Jesus Christ. It is Christ who has been promised to Israel. It is Christ who now is realized as the Savior of the whole world that every sinner, and this is Paul's point over and over and over again. He's like, guys, you're in the same boat. You all need mercy, and you all can find it in Jesus. I don't, I don't admire a lot of like, celebrity pastors, okay? I, if anything, I, I tend to be a little bit of a skeptic. I realize this about myself. I don't admire a lot of folks that are like in the limelight and everything. But one guy that I really admire was Tim Keller. And if you know, if you know anything about Tim Keller is uh, he, just, he just went to be with Jesus on Friday. Um, and he's just a, a faithful man. He just, again, he... Yeah, I heard one person say that, again, his whole mission and what he did is he just, he just wanted people to adore Jesus. And what Tim Keller would say over and over and over again, what he loved to say is he said, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dare believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. God's promises are wrapped up in Christ. That's true for Israel and that's true for us. All men, meaning in this context, both Jew and Gentile alike, have been bound over to disobedience, right? Paul's made this very clear. Every person is found as rebellious against God, and God has given us over to our, those, the slavish consequences of that rebellion, a broken relationship with him that recklessly and fatally leads to broken relationships with ourselves and with one another and with all of creation, but Paul's like, the fact that that's true for all men, Jew and Gentile alike, that no one can save themselves, that everybody's desperately and hopelessly lost, also means that God can offer all men equally his mercy in Christ. And when that mercy is received, it is irrevocable. It is irrevocable. Do you know why? Because that's on God. It's not on you. What a blessing to walk through life with that kind of knowledge, right? Like what insecurity did you walk in here with this morning? That you're not good enough, that you're not loved, that you're forsaken, maybe that God is done with you. <laughs> That, that you, you've, you've blown it too many times, that, you know, that maybe God's love ha, has, has a meter on it or a, a, a limit on it, that God would for, for, forfeit his grace to you. Let me encourage you with this. God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. The initiative is his. The work is his. The completion will be his. God is being faithful and will always be faithful to his gifts and his call. 
Amen? All right, these last few verses. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? From him, for from him and through him and to him are all things. Sounds like a good song, right? To him be the glory forever. Amen. So lastly, in this chapter, again, to be fair, it wasn't written in chapter and verse when he wrote the letter, but lastly, right, as he wraps up this theme, some people say that really the theme of the first 11 chapters, we hear Paul give this doxology. Maybe it's labeled that way in your Bible, a heading that, again, Paul didn't write. But So what's a doxology? What's a doxology? A blessing, a final blessing. It's often used that way. Yeah, it probably could be used that way too, right? It's even simpler really than this. I mean, if you look up in Webster's, it just says a doxology is a short hymn of praise to God. A short hymn of praise to God. So this is what happens. Paul's writing these letters, right? Paul's writing these letters and he's having all these thoughts and he's talking about these mysteries and he's, he's talking about God's plan of salvation with both, for both Jew and Gentile and he brings them together in this one multi-ethnic family of God, right? New status of righteousness, new family put together, a new humanity moving from being in Adam to in Christ and all of a sudden he worships, That's what he does. He's just like, whoa, stop. Whoa, right here, right now, we need to praise God. And he does this like a lot. So um, John Stott, again, I say I read a lot of different people, but he's, I just, he's the most quotable to me. Just a little paragraph as he gets in before this doxology. He says, for 11 chapters, Paul has been giving his comprehensive account of the gospel Step by step, he has shown how God has revealed his way of putting sinners right with himself, how Christ died for our sins and was raised for our justification, how we are united with Christ in his death and resurrection, how the Christian life is lived not under the law but in the spirit, and how God plans to incorporate the fullness of Israel and of the Gentiles into his new community. The horizons are vast. He takes in time and eternity, history and eschatology, justification, sanctification and glorification. Now he stops out of breath. Analysis and argument must give way to adoration. Like a traveler who has reached the summit of an alpine ascent, wrote L.F. Goddard of Nickendell, Switzerland. I don't know how to say that. The apostle turns and contemplates. Depths are at his feet, but waves of light illuminate them. And there spreads all around an immense horizon which his eye commands. Before Paul goes on to outline the practical implications of the gospel, he falls down before God and worships. The prompting of this worship of this doxology is is the profound wisdom of God revealed through his plan of salvation for both Israel and the Gentiles, that God's generous resources, his thoughts and his decisions, his activity, his journey, his plans are unsearchable. They're like the farthest depths of the sea or the farthest expanse of, of the universe, right? They, the idea is that they're, in, they're inaccessible minist- uh, mysteries, God's never needed any advice. He's never needed any counsel. His knowledge and wisdom are so vast that that they could never be searched out. They could never be exhausted. God's smarter than you. (laughs) He's smarter than me. I may accept this here, but am I accepting this here? But stunningly, God applies this this knowledge and this wisdom and this holiness and glory and self-sustaining power in all its infinite glory. He applies it to saving sinners. 
He applies it to this great plan of mercy. And grace through Jesus. In his riches and wisdom and knowledge and judgment and paths, he, he offers the riches of his mercy and a path that leads back to himself through Jesus' death and resurrection as we put faith in him, both for the Jew and the Gentile. The author Everett Harrison says, God's, thought, God's thoughts and ways are not those of men, but are infinitely higher and better. But instead of being vindictive, God is gracious. God relies on no one. No one could ever say, God needs me. No one can ever say, God's in debt to me. Like ever, in any way, shape, or form. But we are truly in debt to God. And we are in debt to God in our rebellion, in our sinfulness. And God's like, I owe you nothing. but I am willing to cancel all the debts of all you debtors, all the sin debt for anyone who will call out to my name, for anyone who will come to Jesus in repentance and faith. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. God is the source of all things. He's the sustainer of all things. In him, all things find their life, meaning, and fulfillment. He is the goal of all things. All things begin with him, are maintained by him, and will return to him. As Jesus professes of himself in Revelation 22, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And because of all this, to him all things should give thanksgiving and praise and honor and devotion and glory forever. So Paul began with a warning against conceit. He's like, <clears throat> I need to unveil a mystery to you so that you don't get conceited. Because truth, God's truth, will dispel conceit. He begins with a warning against conceit, which is fueled by ignorance and an overinflated views of self-grandeur, and he ends with worship. Rightly proclaiming that all glory infinitely belongs to God in Christ. Where ignorance leads to vanity, God's truth must lead to worship with my whole life. And we'll, we'll see this as, Paul, as we move on to chapter 12, right? With my whole life as a sacrifice to him. To truly know God personally, not just a mental and an intellectual ascent, but to truly know him personally leads to humility and worship. To know God through Jesus is to worship him. And so I want to conclude and um, and then the worship team will come up and sing the last song. And I'm a little uncomfortable doing this because I don't have a great voice, but I want to conclude by us singing together. And I, I ask you sing out. I really ask that you sing out. I want us to sing what has, has come to be known simply in the last three centuries as the doxology. And, and it just, if you don't know it, it simply says this. It's not long. It says, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures, right? This is us, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's, let's sing this together, nice and loud. Ready? Praise God from whom all...